trying to get this. I know Hashim is having issues, so I'm trying to set up my... Okay, come on. Docker environment. Okay, that is what's going on here. Oh, jeez, it copy-pasted everything all at once. Really? Alright. Um, so... I guess we'll just start going through things. Or I wanted to tackle this first. Is Hashim on? No, he's not. All right. Well, I guess we won't tackle this first. Oh well. Um, okay. Just a quick update for you guys. Um, so I was hoping to get this done before the meeting today, but it didn't happen. Um, oh well. It'll get done after the meeting. But. Um, Oh, I'll show you right here. So basically, I was working. We've we've been talking. I we've talked about how um, uh, we wanted to get the HTTP API into the Quick Start documentation. Um, it's this pull request right here, um, and so I'm almost done with it. I had to refactor some of the test code. Um, this is now done, um, and so basically, what we're going to end up with is. Like at the end of the quick start documentation, um, when you go and it's like it talks about how to do it from Python, then talks about how to do it from async Python, um, then it will basically jump to something like this where we start the HTTP server and I added a new syntax so we can sort of just like pre configure the model. I don't know if you guys have played with the HTTP server, but the idea would be it, it provides you all of the, I mean, you can do anything from the HTTP server that you can do. Um, from the command line or from the Python API, um, and that's what's going to let us write the web UI. Um, and so, uh, um, basically, I just added the same same ish syntax. Basically, the syntax that you have for sources is now also the syntax you have for models because with the HTTP API, you could have multiple models active at the same time. Um, so you basically you load the models, you tag them with their their label. Um, so like my model equals the SLR model. Um, and then you say, you know, all their options. Um, and then the HTTP server will have that model um, running on whatever given URL. Um, uh, like it'll be on my model. So for example, you'll, it'll be in the quick start in a minute. But if you were to say slash, if you were to send this data to model slash my model slash predict slash zero, then you would end up with this as the response, which would have the prediction in it. Um, so that's um, that's just what's it's going to be there very soon. Um, I didn't get finished with it. I'm almost done with it, but eh, alas, that's how things go. Um, so let's see. Uh, quick start with addition of HTTP service uh, to to model prediction, almost done. Um, other news, do I have any other news for you guys? Um, let's see. Uh, I don't think so. I think that's about it on my end. Um, we're still doing the, the GSOC. We have to go through and evaluate everybody's proposals. Um, and then we're, we've got you know, we're all putting our mentor comments on the finalized proposals, and then we have to make a decision eventually. Um, but we don't make that decision yet. So, uh, or we haven't made that decisions yet. And obviously, you won't find out until the 4th anyways. So, uh, that's all the news on that front. Um, all right. Well, let's see. And Hashim is here. All right, great. Okay. Can you guys hear me, by the way? I assume you guys can hear me, but... No one said anything. Yeah, yeah, we can, yeah. All right, okay. Yes, we can hear you. Great. All right, let's see. Um, so, first thing we're going to tackle today 
is the fact that um, you're having issues, Hashim, you're having issues with the entry point name stuff. And so this is stuff that I recently added so that we could have, um, why did I add this? Um, oh, for the labels. Um, basically, all right, well, I'll run the script and I'll show you guys. Uh, uh, John, can you uh, explain the entry point thing to, uh, I also don't understand. Ah, uh, yes. All right, so this is why, all right, so, uh, let's see. Let's just go to setup.py. Can you guys see my screen well enough? Really? Uh, uh, yes, uh, okay. we can see your screen. Oh, well, that doesn't work either. Okay. <laughs> what? Uh, is it possible to zoom in a bit? Yeah, okay. So, yeah, if, yeah, that's what that, that was my, that was what I was wondering. So, let's see. Let me just open it up in GitHub because that is, then I can change the zoom easier um, so this is probably something that we need to document as well um, so, da, 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 da. all right so entry points uh, we'll just take it from the top so the entry point system is this system that, that Python has as, as a language um, or well yeah as a language um, that uh, allows us to sort of like it, it's it allows us to give a path to some Python object within a Python file um, within our package and then label it as some label um, and that way we can load it uh, other Python programs can can use this uh, interface provided by um, the Python package packaging library or the package resources library um, to discover what Python classes or functions or objects have been registered with that entry point um, so the nice thing about this is uh, what it lets us do is is we can we it, it basically facilitates this plugin system that we have um, so by registering a class or a function um, with the entry point. Uh, so the way that we do that is we say entry points, for example, console scripts is, is a set of tools specific thing. So set of tools is the package that actually is in charge of installing Python packages. Um, and set of tools says, okay, if you see any, if you see anything in this array in console scripts, then I'm going to create a file within the path um, that calls this function. It loads this function and it calls it. Um, and obviously, the function is is this main method within the CLI uh, class within dffml.cls.cli, and then the colon says uh, the colon is the separator between this is the path to the file in Python notation with the dots, and then this is the um, function on the other side. Um, so that's, this is, this is how it works for the standard. Um, the standard, the, this is like what setup tools is doing when it sees this. And we're doing a similar thing. Basically, we say, okay, whenever you want to load a source, we go and say, okay, look through all of the entry points registered under the dffml.source entry point uh, or all of the 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 i guess labels they they they're just called the the syntax for this stuff is weird when you look it up it this is called a entry point i believe um so each entry point under this dffml.source um label i guess um I guess label is going to become an overloaded term real quick, but basically, if we want to find all of the entry points which are a dffml.source, we pass it to this function. Da, 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 da. dffml util entry point. We pass it to this function right here. Here, uh, da, da, package resources dot iterate entry points. Um, so 
this function. Uh, so class dot entry point is the dffml dot source, and then when we call this function, let's see. Okay, come on, that was very unhelpful. I say, where's the package resources API? Uh, uh, come on now. There we go. Uh, okay, this isn't really like the main documentation. The main documentation is kind of hard to find. It's within set of tools. Yeah, there we go. I believe. Try to find it here. All right, here it is. Yes, this is the main documentation for this thing. Oh, wow, that made the docs look all weird. Okay, uh, yield entry point names from group matching name. Oh, wow, look at that. You can do filtering. Okay, I just learned something new. Um, that would be very helpful because we have this whole thing that does filtering here. So now we don't need that. Um, but basically, yeah, it just it goes through all of the things so for every package it looks through every single package and it looks at the dffml.source and then it looks at what's under there and if you actually want to see what that looks like i think some of you have discovered that if you look in .ig info and you look in entry points um, there's an any file in here and the any file is basically just when you install the package it creates this any file and that's why if you modify the entry points within the setup.py, you have to reinstall the package because it's regenerating this any file. And so unless you reinstall the package, this any file doesn't get read. And this function, this iter entry points function, is just going through and reading the any files. So it's not reading the setup.py's. So you have to reinstall the package when you modify the entry points because it's regenerating the any file which is what's actually getting read um all right and as you can see this is just a mapping of you know the the, the label to where we can find that thing now this this is all well and good right but this doesn't tell the actual objects themselves what they should be called right because this is just in the setup.py um and now when we're doing testing and other things, uh, like when these things, so this works well if we're going to load it by looking in, like by calling this function, right? So if we're, if we specify CSV source on the command line, um, then that's all fine and good because when we load it with iter entry points, we know that it was CSV source. Um, now the thing is, uh, and we can set the entry point label equals. So here we say, okay, when we load the thing, the label equals whatever it was, right? CSV source. Now, this is all well and good, except for if we're not loading this thing via the command line. Like, what if this thing is being loaded via some test case, right? Um, well, in that case, we need to have this entry point label already set, which is why we have the base entry point um, and entry point decorators. Um, and so you guys have probably seen these. Um, so what they do is basically they say, okay, the entry point is the first argument and that's going to tell it like, okay, if you try to call uh, dot load on some class, right? Like if you call base source dot load, then it's going to call, it's going to end up calling this load method because base source derives from entry point. Um, and you have to put this base uh, entry point decorator on anything that derives from entry point because you need to set it's going to go ahead and set this entry point um, class property so that it knows what to iterate over with the package resources um, iter entry points right um, and then it's also going to set 
the default entry point name. Um, and default entry point name is the next argument here, or the next series of arguments if you wanted to. Um, and so this says that dfml.entryPoint um, is going to be referenced as entry point, right? So what that what this means is that when you're typing a command, and actually this is actually a great example of that. Um, so you may have noticed that when you're typing a command on the command line, right, and you have like a model command, or better yet, you have a source command, right? So you may have seen, we, we've seen this syntax where you say sources equals, and then you give it some, some, some label here, equals the source type, right? And then you say source, my source file name, training.csv. Well, you don't have to say my source. If you just say source file name, it's going to infer that you are talking about like the only source there, right? And well, it's doing that because we've set this entry point name to be source for the case of sources. And uh, we'll just go to sources so that becomes more clear. Um, uh, slash source slash sources. All right, and then we're going to move on soon because this is getting a little long. Um, but it is important because so much of this project has to do with configuration um, to make all of the plugins work together. Let's see. Yeah, so here you see dffml.source and then source, right? So if you took off this my source, it would still work because as, as Saksham has seen with the code that, that does the configuration, it basically does, it does two checks. It says, okay, do I see source, my source, file name? Okay, if I do see that, I'm going to use that as the file name for my source. If I don't see that, do I see source file name? Okay, if I see that, then I'm going to use whatever that is as the file name for my my source, right? Um, because sometimes, like, when you're... So you can specify multiple sources, right, to training commands and actually, like, to the machine learning-based commands. But sometimes you all like a lot of the time you're only specifying one source in which case it's kind of just overkill to write um source my source file name every single time if you only have one source right so what this lets us do is uh it just lets us um specify which source if we want to otherwise it'll apply to all of them right and and not just sources basically whatever plugin type so it works for models too and that's why um that's why we have the entry point name. Um, and so what's going on here is like the error that we're currently talking about is, um, let me see if I can run it. Doc test. Okay, so yeah, there's something wrong. Um, so there's something wrong with your environment, I think. Um, let's see. So the, the error that Hashim is running into is saying that associate has no attribute entry point name. Um, and the reason why that is, is because associate is an operation implementation. If you mess with the operation implementations, they're kind of weird, right? Um, they're an operation and they're an implementation all in one. Um, or like, well, there's the operation implementations and then there's the things that you decorate with the op decorator and those create like this sort of special concept, which is like this op imp, which is the operation implementation all in one. Um, and so what happened here was because, so the way this should work is that the operation implementation class will have the entry point name on it, but uh, operation implementations are weird or like the dffml.operation entry point is weird because we have to make it sort of easy to use. We used to have this thing where uh, it used to be that you had to register the operation implementation separate from the operations. Now you don't have to do that anymore. Now you just put everything under dffml.operation and if it happens to be an operation implementation rather than just an operation, then it basically does the association and maps both of them, um, depending on what you're trying to load. If you're trying to load it through the uh, 
through the operation. If you're calling operation.load, it'll load just the operation. If you're calling operation implementation.load, it'll load the operation implementation. Um, and because of that overloaded behavior, that's why we ran into this situation um, where we have to um, basically all we have to do is we we in the op decorator, if we decorate something with op, we entry point name. We just throw on the entry point name of operation so that it knows that this thing is an operation. Um, and that's for the purposes of generating docs, plugins. And this is what I was saying again, like if you're loading these things via the package iter entry points, usually you know what they are. But if it's for testing, you don't. I guess in this case, we could have assigned it, but it's better that we keep it um, here because if we need it within just the Python environment where um, we didn't load it via the iter entry points, like a lot of the test cases will break basically if these decorators don't exist um, because they're not being loaded via the, the command line way of loading things. Um, so here's the example. All right, so this is why... And what is that one in question? Well, maybe it's not even there, and maybe that's what's going on. So you said associate. Thank you. Um, let's see. Oh, this could be why. What's going on? Because... Uh, Oh, that's weird. I'm not seeing associate. Let's see. Or what? Oh, it's associate lowercase. Yeah, here it is. All right. So what? The reason why it's throwing that error is because it's trying to figure out what is the entry point name, because uh, it's generating these labels so that we can link um, across the documentation. Because you can't link to a specific header on a page. Uh, without doing one of these labels, and so the label has to be specific enough. So we need to make sure that we're saying it's a plugin, it's an operation, and here's the package of the plugin, and here's the operation name. Um, and so, for example, like with all the Git ones, um, they are where is it? Lines of code to comment ratio DF of, or plugin operation DFML feature Git lines of code to comments, right? So that's a really long label. Um, and the reason why we have those, so let's see, was because we needed to do uh, docs, usage, IO. So when we added this the other day, we found out that, well, we really need to be able to link specifically to this model plugin, right? So now the result of this is you can say ref, reference, specifically this section within that that file so you can say i want to link to plugin model dffml slr and when you're on the doc site um and you're going through this tutorial and you say oh we're using the simple linear regression model well what does that mean well this is what it means um and here's the docs for it right um, okay, and that was a very long-winded explanation, but hopefully complete about uh, what are entry points and what is all of that stuff. Is there any more questions on that? Because I know I probably missed something. Uh, uh, not right now, I guess. Uh, it was a really good explanation. Thank you, John. Okay, no problem. Yeah, thanks. I hope I hope it was. I mean, I think it was pretty complete. Um, but I definitely there's there's lots of things there. Um, the entry point, the util entry point file can sort of clear up some of the stuff. Um, but for this issue specifically, Hashim, I would say I just so I just pulled master, and I ran. I pulled master, and I ran the doc tests. Um, and it looks like it worked fine. Um, and I did the I did the fresh container install thing. Um, I did this right. So I, I ran this container, and then I did this, um, and it looks like it's working fine. Um, so we can try it on your branch here, um, real quick. Da, da, da. Um. 
Well, can you let, or let's see, so what, what's your current setup? Um, you've got it in the container. Um, let's see. Yeah. Let's see if I'll apply the patch and we'll see what happens. doesn't like adding mapping. All right, let's just do it manually. Okay. Huh. Da, da, da. Looks like your test got at it, that's for sure. So, nice, and your test passed, so that's great. Um, sweet. Sweet. This looks great. Um, hmm, yeah, and it looks like it's all working. Um, okay, so, well, the good news is all is well. Um, I guess... You do need to add to the change log to make this. Um, oh yeah, you need to do these guys, and then you need to add to the change log, um, and then I think this is good to go. Um, so let's yeah, see. Yeah, I was actually adding the uh, DB operations to this one as well. Oh, okay, let's just do this as as its own thing then, because since this All is right. pretty close here. Um, okay, and then the other thing is. Um, Okay, so why why is this happening? Can you go ahead and try doing these commands again? And let me th throw this in. Um, yeah, I'll try to create a fresh container and see what happens. Yeah, I have a feeling that if you do, even if you just did this in the existing container, yeah, probably best to create a fresh container. But even if you just did yeah. this in the existing one, I have a feeling that it would it would clear itself up. My guess is something got installed not in development mode. Um, and cause sometimes that happens. I don't know why, but things are weird. Pip is weird. Um, but yeah. Okay. Yeah. And let us know how that goes. Um, so, yeah, but sure. good news is it, it should it should work. Um, so it is there is hope. Um, okay. Um, let's see. All right. Um, let's just note about that. So explained entry points. Uh, or about if I meant, let's see according for more details. Okay. All right. Okay. So what uh, what's what's up next? Um, who wants to go next? Yeah, John. Yeah. Uh, hello? Am I hey, right? hey, yes, we can hear you. So, uh, so I have some questions uh, regarding the deploy thing. Mm -hmm. So uh, when we get a webhook notification, uh, do we pull down the, like, do we pull down and report to a new folder or okay. since we want the is working on the current folder, right? So Yeah, so... Like, uh, yeah, so this is, a, this is a good question. Um, okay, so we have a couple ways we can do this. And I was thinking about this some more, and um, I was thinking, let's maybe just not mess with that at first. I think what we want to do for now is kick off a data flow, um, because then we can make the behavior completely customizable, right? Um, so I think that we probably want to we want to figure out, like, what is the... And, and maybe it's just like the whole webhook structure that goes in as the data type um, as the input data to this flow. Um, okay. And then 
but yeah, so we'll just kick off a data flow for now. So basically you make you make that webhook service, like you just make that handler. So let me let me just make these notes. Um, uh, where's that issue? Where's that issue? Um, let me just clean up here because or else I get all over the map. Um, I know, yeah, I think, let's see. Yeah, from the perspective of 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 what do we do? Um, let's. Where is that? Um, we'll like leave I it. I saw you. Like I saw you made a note that you we have to check first if there are any uncommitted changes, but we will not always know where the folder is, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So this is yeah, this is what I'm thinking is so so my original the original plan with this was sort of like you would you would dump it on your server and then um, you you would start the webhook on your server and then any time it got a request it would like pull down the new changes to the Git repo that you were currently in. Um, but that doesn't really make any sense actually. Um, so because like in this the the more common use case here is probably going to be like, uh, I start this webhook on my server, and every time we're going to provide a data flow, that um, every time it receives the webhook, it creates a tempter, it pulls down the Git repo, um, and we've already got operations for this, right? We've got the Git operations, um, and then we need an operation for like build a container. Um, so basically, see if the Git if the Git repo has a Docker file, we build a container, and then we redeploy the container. And this is all stuff that's going to be like just operations in a data flow, right? So if we just give the webhook the ability to run a data flow whenever it receives the, honestly, wait. Now the more I think about this, I'm not even sure we just need this because we already have the HTTP service. And if you just registered a path on the HTTP service, you could just register a data flow to that path. Um, yeah. All right. Sorry. I was like, I had tried to think this through, but this was, it started out as like a note that I jotted down because I wanted to make sure not to forget. Um, okay. Uh, you see what I'm saying? Uh, that uh, you pass the path and the data flow to the HTTP config. Yeah, exactly. Like because the point of this was, oh well, we need this deploy service so that when it hits the, like you can set this deploy service up and and then it will, um, you know, it will receive it on it will receive it on some path this webhook and then it will do something and then I just realized we're just reinventing the uh, HTTP service. So, um, like I realized that when I started writing the service, like most of the code was the same from the HTTP. Service. Yeah. Okay, well, sorry about that. At least you're familiar with it now. <laughs> um, let's see. Um, yeah, because... Also, do we assume the Docker file is in the root of the repo, or do we search for the Docker file? It does, yeah. So I guess, you know, this is one of the things that we need to that we need to think about here, and I, I think this is like... So let's just make some notes here, and then we can transfer them there later. So uh, realized that we probably don't need the deploy service. Uh, what we probably need need is to uh, create some operations that know how to build a Docker container um, and as well as uh, redeploy uh, container um, so and then let's see um, so let's see let's see let's see hmm okay um, we don't need another service uh, we can just give instructions on registering a data flow under uh, uh, un using the HTTP service um, uh, the HTTP service for some URL to be used by or as the webhook receiver. Um, 
Okay. Uh, and let me just sort of pull this up for a second. Um, so just to be clear, what we're talking about here is like this is. I think this is the only example at the moment. Um, but in this example, um, oh, okay. Here we go. This is going to be. This is. This is. This is. This is what the deal is. Okay. So right now, um, right now, when we Okay, so this is the current example for how do you use the HTTP API with the data flow. Um, and we basically, we take the should I data flow and we put it behind this dash slash should I URL on the, on the HTTP service. And it, and it runs the data flow and it gives us the results. Um, now the input requires that it be in the same format as run data flow. Um, where you're saying, okay, what's what's the value, and then what's the definition, and you have to do like you know you have to put it under the context and everything. Um, so I'm now thinking that our first step here really is to to modify the issue to API to say to have like a, a couple ways that it can deal with with the inputs, right? You could say, okay, the first way you can deal with the input is this way, right? Um, I don't know what we're going to call this, but we will make a name for it. So let's let's just let's write this down. Um, so modify new plan. Need to modify the HTTP API so that um, we can we have multiple ways of dealing with the input. Um, so, number one, oh, I can't change it. Okay, whatever. Number one, or it doesn't really matter. So, we need a name for the existing. Okay, and and this is going to be some command line, for, or this is going to be an option to. What is this called? Ah, the channel config. Okay. It's going to be an option to the channel config, which is this thing, right? Um, so uh, it will be an option to the channel channel config, and I believe this is the class name. Uh, uh, we'll just put channel config. Um, so we need a name for the existing way. Um, which is to which is the run data flow style of value of specifying value and definition um, So each, like, uh, why why are we having two different ways? Like, uh, we'll get the data from the post request anyways, right? Yeah. So you get the data from the post post request, right? But we might. So we want to. We want to. So. Okay. So the reason why we have two different ways here is because it, this. So for the webhook, all is well if um, this this all works fine. Okay, so for the way that it works right now, we can specify, okay, I have this, this, I wonder, there should be an example at the bottom. Yes, okay, there's an example. This is the reason why it works the way it does now. Because you, if you were to just take the whole input body and assume that it was one value for one definition, then you couldn't do things like this where you're leveraging the whole run data flow thing where you can run different contexts with different input sets, right? Um, in this example, we bas we say, uh, we specify that for insecure package, here's the list of inputs, and for DFFML, here's the list of inputs. And the result is that it runs both of them right concurrently and does the analysis, um, right? And, and so we can only do that because we can specify multiple um, we're, we're, we're able to specify multiple inputs for multiple contexts. If we just okay. took the input body um, as like, if we posted insecure package or something, then we would have to, like we would only be able to do one thing with that. Um, 
Hmm. And and that's that's why it works the way it does. It's just a pass through because this was sort of like the easiest the easiest way to get the to replicate the the, the functionality. Um, uh, uh, the most transparent way too, right? Um, and so this is yeah. So this is the existing way, but we need a new way, right? And, and the new way could be I, I see two two paths for this, right? And and we'll we really only need to concern ourselves with one of them at the moment. Um, we have I think we should be able to take the we should have we should have three input modes, right? And you'll use and you'll switch the input mode. Um, the uh, option to channel from config called uh, input mode or something. Um, and the input mode, it'll just, you'll say like, you know, this one, if we call this one default, right? Um, then in this file, it would be like default colon, the next line would be default or input mode colon default. Um, and in that case, it would operate as it does right now. Um, now we need a new input mode that's like, um, uh, mm, let's see, maybe we say like, input, uh, we need a way of saying, okay, input mode, default, input mode. Um, uh, we Okay, so we need two more. One is basically we're gonna use a data flow to decide to transform the input into whatever it should be, um, right? You could specify a data flow, and there would, let's not worry about this one for now, but just in the future, um, you could give a data flow as the data flow to process the input and output it into this format that we have currently as the default format, right? So if I see some sort of you know arbitrary request body, it's an array of two values, right? Okay, well I'm creating this data flow that's basically going to export like the the res return value of the data flow would be this structure when it sees an array that is you know for zero with index insecure package second index dffml right then this you know hypothetical data flow if we if we specified use a data flow and then we specified that we should use this data flow this hypothetical data flow would turn that array of insecure package comma dffml into this value here which is you know the run data flow style thing so it would be some data flow that transforms whatever the body input is into the thing that we're actually going to pass to run data flow um, so that's that's like something that we'll need eventually but not now so not now but eventually because that gives you complete control over what the hell are we doing with this thing and then we need the last mode which is basically just take the whole input body and assign it to this definition um, and so uh, actually well there's one more um, we need okay so for now uh, have add a mode which says we should take we should treat the whole input body as a certain definition. Um, uh, also provide, and this is like, eh, this is, I don't know if it's really, it's sort of wrapped up in this, but also provide a way to have the input be treated as, or no, don't worry about this for now. Um, so, so for now, add a mode which says we should treat the whole input body as a certain definition. Um, and we specify the definition to the input mode, or does it come with the input body? How are we treating that? Okay, so basically, with you for this case, right, we're seeing the the webhook post requests have come through, right? And, uh, well, I don't have an example of that right now, but it's this giant blob, right, um, of JSON. Yeah, I, I and, that yeah, and so basically what you're going to say is in this file, you're going to, you're going to create a new, a new kind of entry. And let me just pull this up real quick here. Um, da, 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 okay. Um, yeah, I have posted the link Okay, great. Great, yeah. So you get this giant blob, right? Um, all right, yes, this, this crap. 
Okay, so yeah. now this is just like okay, great. Like I've got this giant blob. What the hell am I going to do with it? Um, well, what we want to do is we want to just say like okay, this is the this is the thing that's going to get posted, right? So with this option, what we're doing is we're saying treat the thing that gets posted as the value corresponding create a new input element assign the value to this whole thing and then uh have the um have the uh definition be whatever i specify in this config file does that make sense does that make sense sorry i can't hear you uh, no. sort of like did it cut off? Okay, yeah, you're you're cutting off. Sorry. Yeah, is it fine now? Yes. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, great. Okay, so this and this is the channel config. Um, so basically, yeah. what we're seeing here is that um, uh, register config uh, HTTP channel config. Okay, register. Uh, where do we use this damn thing? Oh, yeah, I think we just call register config. I wonder why. There was some reason why. Um, let's see. Um, oh, yeah, because we're loading it like that. I think there's... Oh, I know why. Okay. Um, yeah, so the thing is that there's, this is like half the equation. The other half of the equation here is in um, DFFML, where'd it go? Where'd it go? Should be someplace with the multicom stuff. Multicom is just not the greatest word, but eh, that's what it is. Um, yeah, why does that do multi? We, uh, Arvin and I were trying to come up with what the hell is this thing? And we we're like, well, it's a thing that offers multiple channels of communication, right? Each channel is like a path, right? So if you're looking at an HTTP server, the channel of communication would be the URL path, right? And so this thing, you know, whatever this thing is, um, is some, it's some construct that offers multiple channels of communication. So that's end up being the name for the base class here. It's a multicom. Um, because it offers multiple channels of communication. And so like the HTTP server is a multicom. You could have something like um, like an IRC server could be a multicom, right? Um, if you had messages coming in on different channels and you wanted to treat those channels, like every every message to every channel gets treated with a different data flow, that would, you know, that would be a multicom. Um, I don't know where the hell it went though. Uh, DF of ML, it should be in here. Maybe, oh, it's in DF, that's why. Multicom. Yeah, it's not the greatest name at all, that's for sure, but it is descriptive. Um, it is what it is. Um, well, I don't know if it's descriptive, but it is what it is. <laughs> Open to suggestions. So, let's see. Register directory. Basically, this is a, just this is a mess, um, but it goes through, and this could probably be simplified now with some of the work that you've done uh, recently, uh, but it goes through, and it looks... This is what... so. Uh, where is that? Okay, register. The reason this register config exists is because this base class is going to call that register config method um, to figure out what the hell the config class is. And then it goes through and it basically says um, the data flow. This is the way it looks. So if you name the config file should I in mchtp, so the config files for. You've got all this? Okay, cool. All right, yeah. great. Yeah, so you understand this. But yeah, basically all you're going to do, you need to modify that config. You need to modify the config in the HTTP server side, and then you need to modify the config here. And then if things get screwed up parsing it, you just fix the parsing, right? Um, yeah. So I don't think it should blow up, but it might blow up on you. Anyway, just add this new config mode. Only, only worry about this one for now. Uh, eventually, yeah. add the ability to specify... Um, a and you may want to also do um, you may also want to say uh, along with this 
you may want to say, right, because right now it's just going to take that input body and it's going to be like, well, this is a giant string, yay, and then it's going to pass it on, right? And then your first operation is always going to be, well, parse the JSON, right? And that's not going to be any fun. So you might want to add um, probably, probably want to add a method to, uh, or a option to say how the request body should be parsed before assigning it to the value. Um, all right. So that the first operation isn't always a JSON to parse. Oh, wouldn't this be like our the validate which we currently have? Oh yeah, I guess it would. I guess you could do that, yeah. Yeah, you could do that. You could just do validate and then you could do json.loads. Um, but could you do that? Because this is the thing. Uh, oh, yeah. mm -hmm. You it can't export okay. it, right? If you've exported yeah. it, then json.loads no longer is a thing. Um, and that's yeah, that's why we have that problem. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I think you need this for now, and then we got to figure out that validation thing eventually. The validation thing was very cool. I was very excited about it, but now we got to. Apparently, it wasn't as easy as it seemed. Um, <laughs> nothing ever is, right? Um, data flow to deal to transform the um, uh, request body into. Not now in this set of PRs. Uh, request body into the run data flow style. All right. Um, is there anything else? So basically, I think this is this is the new the new plan here is make 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 a demo where it does some like basically make an example where so new goal. Uh, make uh, some make a documentation page where we show how to use a data flow uh, with the HTTP service to receive a GitHub webhook um, and do something with it. Um, for now, just focus on getting a container built. Um, so, so, and this, so this like, is. Uh, I yeah, added the effort that converting to GIF example. So maybe like uh, the documentation will go uh, after the how first half. We'll modify the operation to have maybe start time and end time, and this the push will just rebuild that container. Is that fine? Uh, wait. Sorry. Say again. Uh, so currently we have a convert to GIF operation. So for now it just takes the input path, and maybe after the first step, like uh, to have a push command. Like, oh yeah. Just add the uh, to take the start time and end time, and so the flow is modified, and now we push it, and the webhook receives a command and just reboots it. We'll show that as an example. Yeah. Yeah. That sounds good. Um, so you're saying you're saying you're going to modify you're going to modify the start time and the end time within the operation the code that runs the operation itself, right? I thought we'll add another option to pass. Like, maybe yeah. Time okay, that's better. That's that's better. Okay, because yeah, ideally the way this would work is the config or well the it really the the imp, you should have an input. Um, uh, an input that that modifies the the start time and end time. Um, maybe we have something like the con there's a config that lets you do the resolution on it. Um, so let's see. Um, so so that that what do you have the code up? I'm sorry, everyone. We we went a little long. We're going long today. Um, basically, okay. So let's just go with this. Let's let's say. Um, for, yeah, for the demo, um, use the FMPEG operation 
um, have have the first commit be or have the yeah first commit slash initial state be um, uh, a data flow so you have a you have like you created the operations right and and then basically you're pushing an update to that deploy directory that has a new serialized data flow and the config now specifies a different resolution does that make sense no, sure. okay cool um have a new, have a first commit initial state where config for operation is one resolution then modify the resolution in the config for this data flow The operations config under play um, and like and show how it gets redeployed. And you could even like, yeah, um, yeah. This sounds good. This sounds good. Um, so basically, the flow here is going to be user creates this, you know, we run them through DFML service create operations, and then we say, okay, now that you've done that, um, here's the, you know, then literal include the FFmpeg file, right, within the examples directory, and then then um, show them how to serialize the data, create the data flow, and then you say, okay, here's how you create this um, Here's how you create another data flow that's going to actually be watching on on the webhook, right? So you're going to have two data flows. You're going to have or two deployment directories. Basically, you're going to have the one that's the that's actually within the FMPEG operations, and then you're going to have the other that's just somewhere else that's actually in charge of doing the webhook. And then in that data flow, it pulls down. It uses the git operations, and it pulls down. It does the git clone, and it has the cleanup, and it does the um, container build, and it does the well. Ideally, it does the deploy. It actually runs it with like Podman or Docker or something. Um, and yeah, you can sort of figure out how to do that, or you can just take take it as far as you want to take it, and then we'll work it from there. Sorry, what? Yeah, maybe we'll do. Uh, I saw the Docker inspect command so that you can get all the yeah. variables which the container was started. Mm -hmm. We'll rerun that. Yeah. I was thinking we'll match the image IDs, and if some container is running with that image ID, we'll stop that. Mm -hmm. Then we'll rerun the command so mm -hmm. it gets started again. Yeah, yeah, that could be a good way of doing that. Yeah, they, exactly. That would be that is exactly what I was envisioning for this in, initially. So yeah, that would be the best way to do this. Um, all right, perfect, perfect. Yeah, and then I mean that'll be a very complete example on like okay, hey. You have some code. You want to make sure that your server is always up to date with running that code. Here you go, um, and that's going to be really cool because then people can, you know, always have their models and all their operations up to date. Sweet. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Hagen. Um All right. Sorry, everybody. That took a long time. Oh, I've been very talkative today. Um, uh, so who's next? What else do we want to do? Hey, John. Yes, uh, sure. me. Yeah, John. Hey, um, let's see. Who's who's going to be shorter here? Do either of you guys have a quick thing? Yeah, yeah. I I just have a quick thing. All right. Okay. We'll go with Hamanshu then. Okay. okay so I am just working on this uh, model predict example uses. That's five thirty six. I just, just wanted to tell you that. Okay. You're just working on that. See five. Ah, uh, yeah. Five thirty six. Issue uh, five thirty six. Uh, yeah. Yeah. If you can see that. All right. Cool. I just I can't remember what this is. So. Oh yes. Uh, okay. Great. Perfect. Thanks. Yeah, and just one thing. I was just going through the doc, and if we go on the plugins, then the edit on GitHub button is ah, open. I think. I just noticed that too. Uh, okay. Yeah. yeah, we got to figure out what to do about that. Um, let's see. Yeah, because all of those don't work. Um, yeah. Okay. Maybe we just we probably just need to make an issue and and leave it as an open issue. Um, so, um, docs. Uh, 
plugins. Yeah, I just found that out when I went and did this. Uh, I was under the HTTP API, and this doesn't work either because this is a sim link, and so this just goes nowhere. Uh, we may have to, eh, who knows what we'll do about that. Um, on GitHub. All right, cool. Thanks. Yeah. All right, Yash, how's it going? Yeah, it's going good. Can you look out at the PR that I made about the Java? Uh, the permission error is still uh, an yeah. issue with it. Let's see. Oh, I don't know if I saw this. Sorry. Sometimes I go to notifications and I click every single one with control and open like 20 tabs with all of them. And then I forget which ones I've actually looked at and I actually haven't. Um, let's see. Um, okay, updated to compress version. Oh, we talked about the dot. Okay, we talked about this. Okay, and then, okay. Let's see what's up here. Okay, dependency judge.xh, and we still are hitting the permissions issue. Damn, all right, okay, well, let's see. What does the check say? Da -da 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 -da. Uh, permission denied. That's dumb. Okay. Um, so this is the way that I've been debugging this. Um, okay. Whenever you send a new thing, what I do is go here and I pull down these guys. So... Let's see what happens if we do it in a container. All right. Oops, Ooh, we don't want that plus. Okay. I don't know. All right, go okay, download Java, download this guy. It's like that we have to do in terminal, we have to give extra permission for executing it by using ch mode and something. Oh, oh, because it's a zip file. Is that why? Let's see, it probably is. We have to give it executable permission using. Yeah, that's right. You're probably, I, I, I haven't, I don't know if I looked at this yet, but I would guess you're probably right here. Have you tried that? Did you try that or? Yeah, I was trying with the. Uh, should I create a new sub process giving the permission using ch mode and stuff? Yeah, that's probably. We'll. I mean, so basically, what I'm going to do here is we'll pull it down and we'll see if that's the case. And um, god damn Java. Um, let's see. Yeah, we'll see if that's the case. And if it is the case, then yeah, the sub process just calling ch mod. Well, uh, you don't actually need to do that. You can actually just do it with Python. Um, um, let's see. So, uh, chmod. Well, not seven, seven, seven. But thank you very much. Um, okay, great. Oh yeah, great, sweet. So this works. Um, so yeah, you can actually just use this function here. Um, but let's see, let's see what happens because we may or may not need that. Because I feel like I saw that it was executable. In which case, there's a different problem. Yeah, Java, it's... I feel like usually it's much faster than this, such so download. It's annoying. Okay, so, and then let's just... Oh, let me just fix this, okay. Backlog. I'm just going to put this right on the backlog because I have no idea what to do about this one. Um, let's see. Mm, well, I guess we won't put it on the backlog. Yeah. No one will try. If someone to, wants to take a stab at this, great. But I, yeah, this one, will, this will take some tricky editing with, uh, editing with the. Uh, this. Also, However, how's the situation in uh, U.S. about the corona? Oh yeah, well, yeah. I mean, 
we're not we're not the smartest um and so they've like there's i mean yeah hmm how do i describe this well like everybody's staying home which is good well not everybody's staying home the thing is like a lot of people whoever can work from home is working from home now um and uh but there's still like a lot of people out and about um, and like all the restaurants are open for takeout and delivery. I don't know what you guys are. Were you, I would be curious to hear what you guys after I tell you guys about this. But yeah, all the restaurants are open to takeout and delivery. Um, and uh, I, I kind of, I'm not so sure about that. That seems kind of like isn't wouldn't food be? I'm not. I'm no. I'm no scientist. Um, but it seems like wouldn't food be uh, kind of a way to transmit that? But who knows, right? I guess not me. Um, and and uh, so, yeah, that's interesting. And then, like, if you go to the home improvement stores are all, like, completely full far- parking lots every day. Um, I recently accidentally broke the toilet. Um, and so I've had to go to the home improvement store several times to try to fix it. And every time I go, it's completely packed. And, like, they're doing this thing where um, they space people out in line, like, six feet from each other. And then when they let them in the store, they're all just, like, roaming around in the store. And not everybody's wearing masks. Like, it still seems like not many people are wearing masks. Like, so it's, a lot of people just aren't taking it seriously still. And, like, then, well, you see the numbers or the effect of that. Yeah. But, yeah, that's how it's going. Like yeah, yeah, that's a bummer. How are, how are you, how is it going for you guys over there? Yeah, our country is in a complete lockdown situation, so we can't get out of the house and such stuff. Uh, the precautions are taken. The yeah. Government. Huh. Well, it's, that's good. Let's see how we will get yeah, away from I guess. this. Like, it could be good, right? Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's see. Unzip. Dependency check. All right. So now, LSDSLAF. Dependency check bin. Okay, um, wait, capital F. Okay, so it's got the executable bit set on it, which is funny. So it's funny. Oof, I can't spell today. Okay, sorry, let me just finish this up and then we'll add those binaries to the pad. And just like, yeah, if anybody needs to drop, just go ahead and drop because I know we've gone, we're going over and we're probably going to continue to go over today. So, um, okay, so um, now what I'm doing is I want to make sure that we add the correct path. So basically the same thing that you added to the path here. So export path equals pwd slash jdk14 slash bin and then a colon path and then let's see java which java okay good java's there and then we want to do path equals dependency check slash bin oops oops whoa what happened there? All right. sometimes I accidentally find out about github keyboard shortcuts I recently I recently recently accidentally found out that okay and this is now in the path all right so weird okay so looks like this is running here um, and then I guess the next thing to be checking for would be a spelling mistake um, so let's see. Dependency check. Ah, that is odd. Okay. Hmm. Permission denied. Dependency check. Dot s h. Okay, this is going to be a weird one. Great. Um, all right. Well, let's pull down this patch. And see what happens. All right. 
Let's see. Uh, okay. Okay. Oh, we got to pull down the last guy, too. So, let's clone this. Download this guy, see what happens. All right, so now I gotta grab this again. And we were scanning extra. Oh, maybe that's what happened. Um, permission denied. Oh, this might be what happened. Okay. Um, let's, we'll see for sure, but let's just try this. Oh, my ass. No, wait. Okay. Yeah, it's going to do the whole thing where it grabs the vulnerability database and everything, so this might take a little bit. All right. Um, okay. You know, here's what I think it is. Um, I think that... What the hell? Okay, so it says... Permission denied, dependency check.sh. Oh, okay, yes. Okay, this is what it is. Okay, okay. So, the reason why it's doing this is because we said CWD equals package, and package right now is pointing to rxjava slash this directory. Well... Yeah. The thing is, when we downloaded RxJava, um, expecting value. Okay, it looks like there's some kind of problem with the JSON, but let's see. Should I? Damn. Okay, whatever. Um, okay, so we downloaded when we did this. Yeah, when we did this, or wait a minute, uh, is this really the problem? Let me just run this test here. So Python, different settings. Give me a different error, which is good. Um, test, 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 test. Dependence check. Okay, let's see if I can spell it, okay. Thanks. Okay. Oh, wait, let me do. I gotta fix that deprecated testing command. Logging equals debug. Come on now. Why is there no logging? Hmm. What is it doing? What the hell? Test, test dependency check. God. Let's okay. see examples. Should I get status? Okay. Um, test, test dependency check. Oh, maybe it's downloading Java. Yeah, that's probably what it's doing. Yeah, it's probably downloading Java. Uh, 
Wait, but it's supposed to read. Yeah, it's pretty downloading Java. Ah, oh, great. Okay, we gotta wait for it to download Java. Or no, it was just loading. Oh my gosh, it was just running Python. Oh my gosh. All right. Have a great day. Yeah. Also, after Java, uh, which language should I uh, focus it? If um, I think there was some stuff for. Um, let's see. Well, there's Java. There's. I mean, I don't think, I think we have I, a I static. Think, yeah. yeah, PHP would be good, but I think we could do more with Java. Um, let's see. Awesome static static. No, so it's good. There's a check uh, uh, framework for Java also. Oh, there is. Let's see. There's, wait, there's what? The check a framework by which we can check. Uh, for, for, here, you can see that. Yeah. Great, great, great. Ooh, type, oh, check, type checking. Mm. Mm. Type checking, let's see. We need something that we can basically just... Um, you know, we need something that we can just, uh, uh, we need something for like the code itself, sort of like Bandit, you know, that would mm -hmm. be nice if we had something like that. Let's see, this looks promising. No, this looks expensive. What is this? Kid, wait a minute. This kid's got a football helmet and he's carrying a basketball. <laughs> this is, I don't know if I trust this thing. Um, let's see. Let's see. Um, oh, 2016. No way. Uh, this could be good. It's still downloading. Okay. Um, yeah, this could be good. Basil build hello. What is well? Okay. Well, that doesn't really help. How do I set it up? Hmm. Basil, Maven, can we just run it though? Command line, yeah. Oh, you actually have to compile the Java stuff. Ooh, yeah, see, this is the same. This is the thing is about C code, is like C and C++. Anything you have to compile, you have to like download all the dependencies and it becomes a giant mess. Um, and so this may not be, it's why like, uh, it may or may not be good, right? It's like, uh, reminds a few pre-configured static analysis tools. Um, yeah, it's it's just it it becomes like a giant mess to uh, get all the dependencies set up, and and that that's going to be like its whole own project. Let's see about this. Um. Uh, Let's see. We need some logging on there. That's that's new new issue. Uh, add some logging. Add some feature requests. Util net. Uh, add some progress logging on downloads. Main point.
Oh, hey, look at that. We got them all. Okay. Tests, downloads. All right, great. RX. Okay, yeah, no, that path is correct. Okay. Okay, so this one is working. Damn, what the hell is up with that? Um, that's really weird. Okay, so it's running on, on in the Docker container here. Um, it's showing the same error when I run it in a Git pod. Yeah, the same error as this, the JSON decode? Yeah. Okay, well, that's good news. Um, so, should I... So, this is where I would recommend, I think we should probably do this for all of them. We should do this try, try accept block around here. Um, so is there self here? Yeah, we'll just add self. If we add self, then we get access to logger. Um, let's see, self.logger.debug. Or, here. Um, Let's try this again and see what happens. Oh, really? What? Wait a minute. Oh, that's why. All right, whatever. Yeah, we don't have access to self because we're just running the function as its own thing. Let's see. Right, it should dump the logs for us now. Yeah, this is weird. Why the hell isn't it working? Yeah. Test downloads. Unable to download metadata file. Hmm. Unable to retrieve. Okay, well this I think is... Let's try to download it. Yeah, it exists. All right. Um, let's see. Uh, well, let's see. Um, this one, okay, this is probably specific to my machine. I would suggest that you add the same line um, with the print statement. Um, okay. Let's see. So, I so I would suggest that you add this here. Yeah, I'll do it. Okay, cool. Oops. Okay. Um, and then as for this, oh, what the hell the is going on with this? Sorry, the what? Uh, the download cache does work with zip file, right? Yeah, it does work with zip files because we got, I mean, it ran here. Uh, or, well, I guess we did put it in the path, so we could probably do or, mm, Yeah, actually, we, we put it in the path with that other one, so we should probably undo that. So, echo path, export path. 
you know what I'm saying? We we downloaded it and we added it, so we probably should unadd it before we run that test case. Aha! Permission denied. Yeah. Dependency check. Thank you. Yes. Good call. Aha! Yes, you're right. You are 100% correct. For some reason... Oh, you know what it is? It's probably because the Python shutil unpack archive does not preserve permissions, whereas unzip does. The unzip utility, the command line utility, so you were you were definitely you were on the right track there. So use definitely use this function here. Um, so use. Oops. Oh come on, where do we go? No. Or actually, you can use you could do. Let's see. All right, yeah, here we go. Pathlib has a ch mod. So, right above here, I would do something like, oops, if you do this, Check to SH. This should do the trick for you. Oh no! Don't add files. Um, all right, there we go. Yeah. All right. So this should do the trick here. Um, five, five, five. Yeah. Let's see. Uh, zero. Oh, okay, I got that syntax correct. So yeah, let's try that, and then um, we'll see what happens. Um, and then when you scanned it manually, did you were you able? Did you see that there were ninety nine total CVs, or are you just did you just put that there for now? Or uh, there were there, uh, there were less than ninety nine, but I put it as a just uh, so that it, after that it should. After it should make a, a error. Yeah. Okay. And then make sure to change this type here then too, because you won't get the right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Sweet. Yeah. All right. I'm glad we figured that out. Good job. You were on to the right. Right. You had the right, right idea there. Um, let's see. So. Okay. And then let's see. Let's see. Um, um, And then let's see, dependency check issue ended up being related to shutil dot unpack archive not preserve in permission bits on the dependency. File. All right, great. Sweet, nice job. Thank you. Thank you, sir. All right, anybody else uh, still awake here? What do we... Uh, you... Hello, this is Dhanshu here. Hey, how's it going? Oh, so uh, I was working on the uh, source for parsing the uh, .ini for file format. Yes. So I made some changes to it, and uh, the tests are still failing. Let's so, see. can you please check it? Let's see. Da, da, da. What do we got here? Oh, don't worry about model TensorFlow. Uh, let's see. Metadata. 
Wait, and should I? Wait a minute. Oh, this happens sometimes. Okay, let's not worry about that. Um, weird weirdness with the npm API. Okay, let's see. Source one nine five. Let's check it out. Oh, um, let's see. Yeah, you want to do, okay. This one is because mm, we need to get rid of this probably long term, but, um, so let's see. I think test custom SQLite has this correct. Okay. Yeah, you need this. Um, uh, I need to skip tag test. Okay, so tags were this thing that we came up with that's like, um, you could have like different versions of a data set. <laughs> so you could have different versions of a data set within the source. So like you might have like V1 or V2, um, like within the source itself. And, um, but we we haven't implemented that for this obviously so we need to skip that test so let's uh let's see um oh no okay files change Alright, so we need to add this. Okay, perfect. Um, and then we need to... Let's see, what the hell is going on here? Target name. Line 70. Oh man, I closed that tab too. Alright, let's see. Try to be better about cleaning up my tabs lately, and this is what it gets me. Uh, let's see. Till testing source. Seventy three, seventy three prediction target name value. Uh, okay. Oh, that's what's going on. Yeah, we're not saving predictions in this one. Okay. Um, hmm. We should probably do this kind of how the CSV source does it. Um, hmm. Should we, or should we just um, this? God, this is gonna be annoying. Um, hmm. Hmm. Okay. Um, okay. 
Um, so the reason why this is happening is because it's expecting the prediction to get saved and loaded, obviously, and we're um, or, and we're obviously only saving the the features, right? So, um, so we can just modify the the test case. Um, we can just write the test case ourselves. So you can just copy paste from this test case and modify okay. it to be applicable to um, to to this. There, uh, uh, I want to try to hide some of the complexity here because it's a tutorial. Um, mm, yeah, this will be good because we don't need that. We don't care about this so much. We don't care about this so much. Um, let's see. Test update. Mm. Yeah, why don't you write test update? Why don't you actually write it yourself? Or like, why don't all the tests uh, for my, by myself, right? Yeah, just write. I mean, just write a few tests for this, basically. Um, right, and okay. so this is going to be used for because that was. This one, I mean, we're, we're intentionally making this simple, right? Um, and so yeah. I think we can just make the decision not to save predictions here. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, let's just go ahead and say um, replace, uh, don't worry, or don't involve file source test just write a couple little tests with comments that uh, test the basic functionality um, uh, let's see ooh you know and what might be nice for this is I just added this function recently um, and this could be good. So for the, this actually might be very helpful for the test cases and making them more simplified. Um, so I just added this recently to the high level API, but I thought there was something with the HTTP API that made me think, well, wow, you know, wouldn't it be nice if we could just like save records real quickly? Um, like just open a source, update it with these records and then dump like, and then be done, close the source. So I made this save uh, helper method that's uh, that's in the high, high level API. Um, and uh, and here it is. It's just, this is all it does. It just says async with source, source has source contact for record in args, update it, right? So it effectively saves all the all the records to that source. So you could just have the, the like, you know, you could use this function and then what we could do is we could make another function called load. Um, and this might be. We can test the loading of the data, right? Yeah, yeah. So, and I mean, basically, what you could do here is, is because uh, the thing is that what what having the save and load function does is it 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 hides the fact that we do that double context entry pattern, which for new people is very confusing, I think. Um, but, and so you probably want to implement the load method. Um, so in another PR, mm -hmm. can you go ahead and implement the load method, which is basically just yeah. going to be like, you know, you could say await load, and then if, okay, let's write this down. In okay, let's see. We'll... So you'll write a few, uh, a couple tests, um, uh, maybe even just one. Uh, but first, just like the new uh, save function in high level. Okay, so the new save function in high level dot py will make writing the tests 
cleaner for um, therefore we should implement a load function mm -hmm. in high level dot py as a separate PR. Uh, once that is complete, um, we'll merge it into master, master, and use it within the tests um, for the any source. Does that sound like a good plan? Or yeah, sure. Do you think okay? If you got any ideas, just stop me. Um, this just seems like it'll probably make the tests look pretty clean. Yeah. Um, let's see. And then, so, for the load function, um, if no... So, if args is an empty array, um, then... So the load function should be, it should be an async iterator record. Um, so this is sort of the return type. It's async iterator record, which means, uh, so, which means the syntax for calling it will be like this. Um, so async for record in load source. Um, now, um, so if you wanted all the records source, it would be, um, oops, oops. All right, this is how you'd get all of them. Um, and then, um, so, let's see. Da -da 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 -da. That means, means you'll want to call uh, source.record and yield each one. Um, uh, unless star args which which is stir is not an empty list then call source that record for each string in the list and yield the record does that make sense yeah, yeah. So yeah, so basically either load all of the records if no arguments are given if the, the, the list of optional arguments is basically the record strings, record record keys as strings, and if those are given then uh, just grab each one from the source and yield that. Um, and hopefully this will make the, the tutorial a little simpler. And then so um, can I ask you to please please create an issue for this? Um, so that the PR for load can close the issue. Yeah, yeah, yes, I will do it. Great. That's just just for tracking purposes, because I found like if we go here and we see like, um, oops, issues. Uh, if you look at like the milestones um, and the closed, it's very helpful because then we can see like all of the issues that were. I've I've noticed this yeah. recently. Just in general for everyone, but yeah, like yes, yes. yeah, then we can see everything that we did. Um, so yeah, if anybody just that goes for everybody. Like if you happen to throw up a PR that you realize that there's no issue for, please make an issue, um, and then we can have the PR close the issue. Uh, just that way, then we know what we did. Um, but yeah, cool. Is there anything else on this one then? Oh uh, no. All right. Uh, that's all I have. Sweet. Great. All right. Uh, is there anything else for today? Yeah, thank you. Uh, John, yeah, uh, we haven't talked. Oh, we haven't talked. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. 
Uh, so how's it going, Saksham? Uh, it's very confusing still, but uh, the thing is that from uh, the function from dict and uh, m uh, mkr are not very clear and are throwing errors every time I try something. So also the cmd.py file is the main file where everything starts. I can't write everything and go with it. I have to do it one by one. So it's taking a lot of time. Uh, okay. Can do you, you want? Do you want? Uh, like, is there anything specifically that we, do you want to show your screen or something? We can work through something, or do you have anything specific that you wanted me to elaborate on? Like uh, the uh, data classes field thing, right? Uh, mm -hmm. And and the uh, using that you uh, making an arg and uh, from the from dict and mkr functions. I'm not very clear about that, and how do I go about it? All right. Um, yeah, let's let's figure that out then. Um, Uh. All right. Uh, okay, so oh, and everyone, this might this might take a while, and I know it's late there. So if you want to drop, feel free to drop. Um, but yeah, we're going to go through this now. So if you want to learn more about this stuff, then, then feel free to stay on. Okay. Okay. So we want to talk about, um, all right. So you want to see how we can take a field and use mkarg on it, right? Oh, uh, yeah. Okay. Okay. So... So here, like, I created a new class, a, pod, a data class, cmd config, and then, uh, and then I made a variable called log with type dict. Uh, and then I gave it is equal to field, and then everything default factory is equal to arg uh, log. Then the f everything in the R contents and everything. All right. So can I see what you're doing? Actually, I think that will probably be more helpful to get started here. Uh, yeah. So uh, like I created a uh, log variable in the cmd config file uh, data, data class. Okay, I see. Uh, yes. So is okay. that how you wanted me right, uh, to create? Okay, it? so, okay, yeah. So here's the thing. Um, the, okay, so let's, let's jump back on the, uh, on, keep, keep it on the, uh, on the VS code. Um, all right, so the field itself is going to get, so, okay, the, you, you don't need to use arc, basically. Um, now, one of the things we haven't figured out is things like parse logging action. Um, so that, that hasn't been... Um, that's not something that we figured out yet. Um, but I don't really know if we need to do that in this case. Um, this is going to come up more. Okay. So the parsing, the parse actions right now, I think are limited to logging and what are they? Let's check it out. Can you go in parsers, parser.py? I think we were able to clean this up pretty much. Yeah, okay. So we've basically got this list action, and then we've got this parse input act, parse inputs action. Um, okay, how should we do this? Um, 
Okay, so okay, so let me just re-explain the the connection between the fields and MKR real quick. Um, uh, when we use MKR, what we're doing is we're taking we yeah okay so we're looking at a field and we're converting it into an argument right so we never want a field to be an argument um, we never want it like you know one of the fields in the class to equal an arg um, because we're going to actually convert it into the arg um, and, and so, so it should be a dictionary it shouldn't be a dictionary basically go back to your where you had that definition and we'll and we'll work through how we define arg or log. So log is going to be of type, let's see. Um, well, it's of type int, technically. So uh, uh, let's see, actually, okay, this one's a tricky one, actually. This, is, this brings us right to some tricky stuff. Um, let's just, uh, let's look at, let's look at one that already exists as an example. Um, how about um, one of the models, like SLR or something? Uh, you uh, yeah, any of them, me to a model in transformers. Yeah, that uh, works. Yeah, this one's got plenty of them. Yeah, okay, so let's scroll on up here. So yeah, there's a lot of fields, right? Okay, so and each one is like, okay, it's got the data type, and then it's got the help description, um, and then it might have a default value. Um, and let's see. Um, Let's see. Um, so, da, 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 da. okay. And then it might have a default. Okay. So, and then if you go to mkarg, you'll see. You'll see how basically it looks at field. So it looks at field default to try to. So it makes the argument and it says the type is whatever the field's type is, right? Um, and then it okay. goes through and it says, okay, if there's a default value, now we need to set the args default, right? And and fields don't allow for default values that are mutable, so like lists and things. So, but but we don't care with args because we're not going to modify them. Um, the an arg never gets modified. It's just a, a uh, in I think in sources it gets modified once to copy it into another class i think I oh think. yeah the uh or i mean modify yeah dot modify yeah that's actually creating a new instance of it um so it never actually gets modified it's actually okay. copying it um and modifying the copy um that's why there's that method um so um okay yeah so then basically we set the default and then well, what we're doing here is we're take we're look we're inspecting this field and we're trying to figure out how do we build the correct parameters to that that arg parse add argument method. Um, now, uh, and, and so that's that's what action is. So action is basically it, it we can use if if it's a boolean value then then store true will end up doing a switch on, on, you know, if you just specify it like a dash, for example, if you have some sort of command on the command line, you say like, you know, uh, uh, read, you know, read only, right? Or read, write, right? Well, we don't need to say read, write space true. We can just say dash dash read, write. Um, and it will assume that it's true. So that's what the, the, the action is. Um, and then we go through here and now we're inspecting the type and when we inspect the type this is like okay we've already got list action actually that's good that's good news um so uh, okay um so okay action list action is that okay sorry can you flip back to um uh command real quick where you had that log, okay. And action equals parse logging action. Okay, this is good, actually, this is good, okay. Um, so we've already got a way of, let's see. The, okay, so the, the, the reason why this is hard is because um, at the top level, 
you have all of these, um, you have various parameters, right? And, and you need those parameters for that command line class to run, right? And then as you go down um, the extra config, like we talked about earlier with the entry points, like that builds this giant nested structure that you saw when you were renaming R to plugin. Um, oh, and yeah. so, because, yeah, because what'll happen is like, okay, well, if I choose a plugin, like if I choose one plugin, then I end up with configuration options for that plugin rather than the other one, right? Um, and so I won't always have all the arguments there because I didn't specify them for that plugin. Right, like I only have the, I only have what was given because I have I've given the options applicable to the plugins that I chose. I don't end up with the options that aren't applicable to the other plugins that I didn't specify, if that sort of makes sense. But, um, so also things like required are gonna basically we're okay. So. You're going to need to look at this, and you're going to need to um, you're going to need to figure out how do I take the things that exist as args and modify either field. How do I modify field to pass them down to? Uh, uh, let's see. Go to field. Go to the definition of field. Um, okay, so. See how we're setting metadata description here? Oh, uh, yeah, yes. So you can put whatever you want in metadata. Um, and then you can access it later in um, in mkarg, right? Uh, because you'll see in mkarg, we add the help from the metadata description. Let's see. Yeah. Uh, okay. If description, then help, right? So anything that you're having trouble figuring out um like you're like okay how do i like what is the how do i how do i pass this down to mk arg right how do i take this thing that i can describe for typing information you mostly need to to figure out like okay you need an appropriate data type for this thing and then you need to figure out how does mk arg uh like for these list actions right so for like sources we're going to need source to have this. Um, we're probably going to need source to have this. Sing we're going to need to add this singleton uh, attribute to source, right? And the singleton is going to be. Um, uh, it's going to be the base base source, right? Um, because each entry, the list, the list is sources, but each entry in the list is a base source, is derived from base source, right? So for that type of thing, you're going to need to work, for the typing information, you're going to need to work with, like, how do I extract what I need to from that data type? So if I set a field and I say sources colon, uh, like, for example, if we're replacing self, like, arg underscore sources, then what we would do is we would say, uh, in the config class, we would say sources colon sources with a capital S equals field, and then you know, like maybe the description for that field, right? Yeah. So let's do this one right now. So let's make a new um, above that right class uh, at config class, um, you know, sources config. Yes, perfect. Um, and then, you know, sources, like lowercase sources. Yeah, do lowercase sources. And then capital uh -huh. sources. Uh, it doesn't matter. I mean, we're just we're just mocking this up right now, right? Okay. So, and you don't even need field here, right? Um, I mean, you could do it, or yeah, do field and say so sources for loading and saving, right? Because uh, we're just gonna copy it, right? And then we're gonna do default, um, or actually, you're gonna have a default factory here. Default factory equals lambda. Um, and then I 
think it's just lambda colon, and then you return. Yeah. Oh, it was here somewhere. Yeah, this guy has it. I think it's lambda colon, and then so don't do it in the array. Just copy paste from default equals sources down here. Just copy paste until the the next comma there. Yeah. So very well. Just sources. You just want sources. So sources, open paren. Yeah. So delete that action and type. Yeah. Delete those two lines. And then delete that. Um, delete that. Paren or delete that. Uh, yeah, delete that guy, and then delete that bracket there, and then delete default equals. So you just have sources. Okay. Yeah, and then delete that comma. Leave that guy. Yeah, perfect. So this is what it looks like now, right? So basically what you're saying is sources is of type sources, and it equals this field where the the description is sources for saving and loading. Default factory is going to let you create this default, and the default value is sources where the first entry is this JSON source, right? Does that okay. does that make sense? Uh, yeah. So what about uh, these guys? Yeah. Okay. So now, now what's going on here? Is okay, and this is going to be this is going to be now a little bit different too. So we're gonna, I think we're gonna need a new thing that we're gonna pass to field that we're going to put in the metadata field, or that we're gonna put in metadata. We're going to have, um, we're gonna do. Let's see. So right now, if you flip back over, so look, look first, look at type. You see type equals base source dot load labeled, right? and action equals list action sources, right? So if you flip back to um, <clears throat> mkarg, so here we see, okay, look, when we see something that's a, that's a list type, we're like, okay, we're gonna add this nargs equals plus, which is what we saw in the previously. And we're going to say the action equals list action, whatever the type is, that will create, that will give us that list action sources, just like we had before. And then we need to set the type equals field type dot singleton. Um, and so go to features real quick and see what is in features. Um, features, dffml slash feature slash feature. Oh, not there. That's the plugins. Yeah, feature slash feature. Okay, here. So scroll down. Damn, we really still haven't gotten rid of that yet. Um, okay. Okay, let's see. Um, okay, just keep scrolling all the way to features. Keep going, keep going. All right, features. Here we go. Singleton feature. So collections.user list and says singleton equals feature. All right. So what we're going to need to do is we're going to need to make it so that um, sources is kind of like features here. Um, now, okay. So the next question is, so what we want to do is we want to go into sources and we want to say singleton equals base source. So okay. go into dfml slash source slash source. And we want, yeah, right next, uh, right under context there. Context equals sources context. Singleton equals base source. Right, so this is saying what we're doing is, uh, I don't know if single, single, singleton may not have been the right choice of words here, but it, it works. It's basically like, what is one of these things? You know, if the, if the plural is sources, what is the singular? Right, so well, it's a base source, right? So if we have 
we have multiple sources, but what is each thing in here? Well, check the singleton property of the class. Okay, each thing in here is going to be a base source. And that's what this property is telling us, right? Oh, um, yeah, yeah. So now go back to uh, where we've got mkarg. Okay, and let's see here. So fill the type that's singleton. Okay, so if has at her type load, then type dot load. Okay, so this is how this is how. Um, okay, this is how. Now this is a good question here. So, okay, so we we are going to need some way to say load versus load labeled, right? And so this is probably a property that we're going to shove into metadata, um, right? Because for some things like feature, we want to use dot load. Right or like models, we want to use dot load uh, most of the time, right? right. Um, and it just so happens that we haven't run into the case yet. We're going to run into it now that I just added the model stuff to um, the CLI command for starting the HTTP server. I did models with load labeled, right? Um, but right now we've just done models with dot load, and sources is the only thing that's had load labeled, which has created you know, this whole problem where we've got sources are different than everything else right now, right? Yeah, yeah. So we need some way to specify, probably I would say you should add something to, so this this if statement here, you want to add another one after that that says, or maybe another one before that, that says if has atcher type load labeled and uh, labeled in field.metadata, then well, yeah and labeled so kind of like if description in field dot metadata or you could do uh, load labeled has a underscore in between load and labeled i believe yeah okay and then you probably want to do if field dot metadata dot git um so Uh, wait, sorry. If has at her arg type, so if the type has, so you see the syntax of the top one basically is checking, okay, what oh, is... Yeah. My bad, yeah, my bad. Yeah, no, you're good. Um, um, yeah, so then, and, and then you want to say, and uh, field.metadata.git um so git is uh, right. Metadata is a dict, and if we use git, then we can have it, we can specify a default. So let's say git um, labeled. Um, so yeah, in quotes, labeled, comma false. Right. So what this will do is it'll basically say, okay, if the type has a load labeled uh, function, and metadata has the keyword labeled set to true because it'll default to false if it doesn't exist then we know that we're supposed to be setting arg.type equals arg. so we're the line above this line where we basically say okay if the type has the load method then we're going to use the load method um, and what that's going to do is just like when you specify a model on the command line it's not actually you know if if we said type equals model it would then pass the string that is the model name to the model right or, or to to mod the class that is the model or that is the base class for models right um because that's the way if you look at arg parse and type and the way it works it basically says okay if i add an argument that if, if i specify the type for this argument i'm going to take the string value of whatever was given and I'm just going to call the function, right? So if I say type equals int, it's just going to pass the string value of two to the int built-in function, and it's going to convert, you know, the string value of two to an int, right? Um, so we don't want that. We want it to call load or load labeled, right? Because we have a string value, and the string value isn't the thing that should get passed to base source or model. The string value is the name of the plugin, which is a model or a base source, right? Does that make sense? Uh, yeah. 
Okay. And in the case where we have labeled equals true, then we have something where it's like, you know, my source equals CSV, right? In which case, you know, we're saying in a, ahead of time here, right, we're going to tell, we're going to, we're going to tell um, the, uh, we're telling mkarg that, that we need the user to, to, to load, to load labeled, um, sources here right like or we need the user to load labeled models here right if they specify labeled equals true within field right so you're going to need to modify field too um to accept the labeled keyword and if it does see the label keyword it it has um it it uh it pushes it down into the metadata property right um okay and so but here basically you'll just have copy the line above and make it uh, you know, arg type equals arg type load labeled. Um, and actually, this should go, this if statement should go above the previous if statement because or else we're going to end up um, never seeing it because if it has a property of load, then, then it will, yeah. Sweet. All right. So now, obviously, this wasn't everything. And for... Logging, you're going to have to figure out. I don't know if there's a logging level type. Let's see. Logging. Let me see. Uh, logging levels. Yeah, logging level is actually... Um, it's an int value. Basically, so what you're going to need, do you see sort of the pattern, like this is, this is why this is not easy. Um, so, but you see sort of the pattern here, hopefully, like you basically are oh, yes. going, yeah, you see the pattern, right? So if you don't have access to something, add it to the metadata. And then for action, I would say action is another one of those things where, okay, right now we're just inferring that if this is a list type, we set the action. Well, if action is set, if you pass action to field, propagate action to field metadata, and then use action within mkarg, right? Okay, so uh, like if, if it's in the metadata, then uh, modify in the mkarg. Yeah, so, well, and, and this will be on a case-by-case -case basis, right? So, for example, if you see here, right, this if statement, the, the if statement is saying the elif inspect is class field type, right? Uh, then we say, we say, okay, this is a class, and if it's a list, then we know we're going to set action equals list action. Well, you're going to probably want something else around here to say, like, um, you know, maybe at the end, even like around if description in field metadata, you could say something like if action in field metadata, well, then arg action equals field metadata action, right? So kind of just work with... Uh, you're you're gonna have to do a lot of a lot of a lot of massaging and, and figuring out like okay like maybe okay if I don't have if I don't know about this right now how do I let myself know about it right if I if mkarg doesn't know about what I should do with this then how do I add it to metadata or something right um, and you basically just do this you keep you keep knocking through I would say try to make these com these config classes um, for as many things as you can, right? Just keep going through and like making config classes for all of these command line, uh, um, command line. Okay. Our sources are data flow and everything. Yeah, all of them, right? And so the thing is, the reason why it works the way it does is because um, the reason why it works the way it does is because we had this, like, it, it gave the ability to subclass really easily, and then all of a sudden, you know, it's like, oh, okay, well, this command takes a bunch of sources and a bunch of models, and, well, then it's a machine learning command, so now we just, like, create a, uh, what is, uh, um, I can't think of the goddamn word for it now. It's, like, polymorphic or something. I don't know. Um, basically, okay, when you have, like, you What? Uh, can you repeat what you just said? Uh, your uh, voice cut off. Oh, okay, sorry. Yeah, so basically, I mean, the reason why we did it this way initially was because you could you could easily, like, you know, um, 
you could you could say okay this is just like if you look in commands right you'll see that this is a sources command and this is a features command and and then all of a sudden you can start like uh having multiple parent classes i think it's called poly polymorphism right it's been a long time um but when you have multiple um, base classes that you're inheriting from um uh, and so there you're going to run into a lot of that which so and basically what i would recommend is you you just just like pull everything out at this point like like if you see these co command classes with multiple base classes because they're all they they wanted to pull in args from just different places just make one big at config class for it because that'll give you more visibility and then you can start having the at config classes derive from each other later right but basically just start making these at config classes like like this something like this whoa um, a lot of stuff going on. Yeah. Did you pull out every single arg just to check what they all were? Yes. <laughs> nice. Um, yeah. So, but basically, yeah. I mean, this is this is an extreme example, right? Um, but but like for example, go to go to ml, go to dffml. slash cli slash ml. py. So ml command, right? Check out ML command. Yeah, so ML command is model command and sources command, right? And so all of yeah. a sudden it got arg model and arg sources, right? And then you get self model and self dot sources, right? So here, all of these are ML commands. So basically an ML command is model command and sources command. So what you're gonna need to do is just this this one actually ended up being easy, right? What you're gonna need to do is you're gonna need to make an at config that's like at ml command uh, config. Uh, your your voice cut off. I didn't. Sorry. Uh, you're gonna need to make a config that's like at ml command config, and what I'm talking about here is because ml the one you're replacing is something that had model command and sources command. What you're gonna need to do is you're gonna need to go look in model command grab that arg model, pull it out, convert it to the new format, then you need to go look in sources command, pull out arg sources, convert it to new format, which is what we just did, and then you're putting them now both in this uh, ml command config, right? And so all I'm telling you is that like you're going to run into these ones, these commands where they have multiple base classes, and so you're going to need to look in every base class and grab all their arguments and pull them into you know, their own config class. Yeah, so I also wanted to ask, like, you, you're saying that make a new config class for every command uh, class. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so not not for everyone, for every unique one, right? For every unique one, right? Yeah. So if, if that will uh, that will not de uh, decrease the code that much and uh, will not look like the unifying stuff is happening. Well, the unifying stuff is not about decreasing the the code base here. It's about the fact that we're we're going to uh, it's it's about conforming the code base all to the same standards, um, right? Because right now we have one way of configuring every single other class and one way of configuring command line stuff. So net on this whole thing is probably going to be like equal lines added and deleted, right? Okay. So this is, yeah, this is no, I mean, this is no small undertaking. This is like, yeah, good, good job doing this. It seems like you're figuring it out. Um, so this, I mean, and this is why I like, I've had so many things to do and this is like, oh, wow, like this is going to be a big one. So I'm glad that you wanted to tackle this. Um, so yeah, so this basically, this is like, this looks good for sources command. I mean, the syntax, honestly, I'm, I think that, that sources might need to be able to, on the same line as that colon, but I'm not sure. Um, but I think, do you get the, do you get the picture of what, what needs to happen here? Not, not that sources, the second one under default factory. Okay. I mean, it's, it'll throw a syntax error at you if it's wrong, but um, yeah, so do you, you get you get what's going on here then? Uh, yeah, I kind of get it now. Okay. Uh, yeah. I'm more uh, clear. I'm getting clearer now. More clear, right? Yeah. No, this is. I mean, this is a big, big, 
big projects. So Every, ev- everything will take. Uh, I have to tackle everything one by one. I can't do it all at once. Yeah, exactly. Tackle everything one by one and make a commit. Right. So so try something. Now make it like go go find a class with very few arguments. Try to convert that one. And then once you've got that one working, move to the next one, right? And every time you've got one working, make a commit and get, right? Or even when you don't have one working, make commits. Just make lots of commits and get and yeah, push them all was, up. Was, that's why I was working on the log one first because it seemed mm-hmm. the easiest. Yeah, yeah. And the log one, it's, I mean, it should be kind of, the log one should be, well, okay, and here's the problem, is that everything takes log. Um, so you have to sort of figure out log first. Yes, um, uh, because then uh, I will won't know what is happening in the uh-huh. CLI. Yeah, so you need to do, okay, for log, we can work through log. So log is of type int. If you look at, at the Python logging library, you'll see that it's okay, of so type. So that's 10 and 20 value, right? That's of info yeah. and yeah yeah right um and so yeah let's see just you can grab that that link there um so it is this is that the type is int right but the default is you know one of these predefined values and then the action like we talked about with action um the action is uh um so parse parse logging. logging action right so action is parse logging action so if you say like we talked about propagate action through field allow setting of action equals whatever and then in def field within base say okay if you see action as one of the keyword arguments put it in metadata right and then you should be able to to replicate log okay so basically at the bottom where you have if description equals field metadata do the same thing for action So at the bottom okay. of this function. Okay, so I also tried another approach uh, uh-huh. of setting it is equal to arg, like this one. Yeah, don't do that. Yeah, uh, because and we're... And this, I wrote uh, uh, some, uh, like, a few loops, like uh-huh. here in parser. Yeah. And then here, another one. Yeah. So the log thing was working for it. It was. Well, that's good. Yeah, so th- uh, that's that's good that you got it working, but we we don't want to set it equal to arg, yeah, right? That's because the we're wrong con- approach. yeah, we're converting okay. field into arg. So what you want to do is you want to iterate over the fields and then just call mk arg, right? And you want to modify mk arg until it gives you the correct argument, right? That you would have specified there. Okay. Right. So you can put required and stuff is probably something that you want to pass down into metadata as well, right? I was just very hesitant because I thought I shouldn't change code much or it yeah. Is, or I no, will this break. is <laughs> now you're yeah. giving me the head up so I can. No, nope. yeah, yeah. You have you have the go ahead. This is going to be a change things everywhere sort of project. Um, this is going to be a big one. So, yeah, yeah. This is going to be good stuff. I think you know mo- mo- once we once you figure out like I think we got sources should be pretty much figured out, and then once you add this action action part to metadata and field and stuff um and then you add required you're going to be pretty much well on the way there now the other thing that you're going to need to think about is that scroll up real quick here um so let's see scroll yeah add subs here yeah so add argument method dot name okay so the thing is what's going to happen now is is this is a for loop over um right this for loop you're going to have another for loop at the same indentation level of that one. And, oh, yeah, that's yeah, where you yeah. already have it. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, that's where you're going over the fields. Yeah. And so you're going to do, uh, you're going to do inspect it members. Yeah, all you actually, actually, instead of inspect it members, add from config, just go, uh, just do for uh, field in data classes dot fields, add from dot config. fields yeah data add from dot config okay okay so i was checking it right there for a different thing. yeah so this is but this so use this instead this just says iterate over all of the fields right and then okay. the first thing you should do is arg equals mk arg uh field 
actually you do you you really don't even need to do this what you can do is okay and this is there's another part here too right so arg equals mk arg uh field right okay so now you've got another problem <laughs> well more problems okay so we also have to deal with positional arguments right so positional arguments is something that you're also going to want to propagate into the metadata right um, so we had talked about this briefly at one point um, and so the record the recording is definitely going to be your friend here of this meeting yeah, um, <laughs> I'm always going back to the last week's recording yeah okay good I'm glad it's helpful um, so let me make sure it's still recording yes thank God okay um, so you're going to want to propagate position into here as well. And you're going to want to go through and probably add all these arguments to some list. And then you're going to say sort by position. And any ones that don't have a position, you're going to say, so if, if position is specified, right, position will be some need to be some sort of integer value, right, that you pass to field. And then it gets put in metadata. And then when you're looping through in parser, you're going to want to say, OK, add all these arguments to a list right now sort now now create a new list that's all the arguments with a position field sorted by position now go through and do add argument for all of the ones with a or wait go through and add argument for all of the ones without a position field and put a dash in front of their name right and so, you know, like, so anything that is not a positional argument will be like dash log is not a positional argument. So it won't, you won't set position when you call field. You'll just do like we've done, right? And, or like sources is like sources is not a positional argument. It's an argument that has a dash in front of it. So basically, unless you see position in the metadata, then just Ha on the first pass, add all the arguments that don't have a position and put a dash in front of their name because the first argument to uh, self dot add argument see method dot name the it's going to be field dot name, but field dot name will need to have a dash like a hyphen prepended to it because or else uh, arg parse is going to think it's a positional argument. So your first loop through, uh, you add all the ones that don't have positional then you take all the ones that have a positional uh, field in metadata, you sort them based on that integer value, and then you add them appropriately in another loop. Um, and you don't put a hyphen in front of them so that argparse knows that they don't need a hyphen. So how will I uh, number the uh, list, right? Well, uh, uh, basically, you're going to look. So arg equals mk arg. If you don't see, um, so look in field.metadata, and if you don't see position, do self.add argument. If you do see position, don't do self.add argument. Instead, append this argument to a list, and and maybe and the position as well or something. Okay, okay, okay. And now I get it. Yeah, yeah. Now you get it right. Or like a dict, right? And then it's zero through whatever. Just make sure that you that first pass add everything that's not a positional and put a hyphen in front of it because arguments okay, that aren't positional. Talking about like this, right? Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Right. Source file name. Right. So so. Uh, well, that one actually is not that. That's one of the ones that gets parsed in extra args, but like model and sources, right? They are they're required, and uh, and they uh, are not positional, right? You can put them wherever you want. If you look at like the merge command, or uh, yeah, the merge command I know is a good example of this, um, but that is that has a positional argument in it. Um, so yeah, dest and src. And right now this is flipped around. Honestly, I really wish they were the other way. And now we're finally going to be able to specify that. So um, so basically, yeah, here, if you converted this merge command, you would have dest colon um, source, or dest colon base source. Nice. Let's convert this one right now.
So yeah, give give it your best shot here. Let me let me see what you're thinking. So uh, like, uh, what will be the command uh, here? Uh, the... So for for log, it's int, right? Go look at sources real quick, and you'll remember where we did sources. You'll that's the that's a good example right now. Okay, okay. Right, so see, we have the what we want to call it, the data type, and then field. So base source equals field, sources to merge records into. And then in this case, currently, this is it's really dumb, and it's got dest is first, and I hate that. And you don't need default factory on this one because there's no default. You want position okay. equals zero, right? Or no, position equals one in this case. And then you just copy paste this and you do SRC. And in that case, position equals zero, right? So then what that means is on the command line, if I say DFFML uh, merge, um, uh, let's see. Um, like file equals CSV DB or MySQL equals MySQL. Oh, that was Is there an bad. example? But, uh, yeah, there should be an example for merge. Yeah, there you go. Now you can see. See, this is this is what's going on. Wait a minute. Or that's data flow merge. Um, oh, there's no command line syntax. Or wait, merge. We can add. So we can uh, add documentation for this. Yeah, we can add right right now. Confusing. Yeah, it is kind of confusing. So this, I'll paste it in right now. What the syntax is. Uh, merge. Uh, I'm Oh, well, sorry, one second. All right, that's, oh, okay, there we go. That's what it looks like right now in the Gitter chat. Okay. Which is why it's annoying, because really, destination should be after source. Which is why it's not documented because it's dumb right now. But now what we'll be able to do is say position under SRC. We'll do, yeah, we'll do position equals zero. And when you add argument, you make sure you sort the list of arguments. So you you went through this list. This is perfect. Yeah, you went through this list in in what is it? Um, command you go through the list of fields, right? And you see, okay, both these have a position. Well, then I'm going to add them to a list of things with a position, right? Add everything that's not, that doesn't have a position. Just do parse, just do self dot ag that argument and put a hyphen in front of it. Everything that does have a position, add it to a list, sort the list, and then uh, add it, you add it to a list while you're in this, data classes dot field loop and then once you're done you sort the list based on position and you um, you sort the list based on position and you then you have another loop and you just add them all in the correct positional order uh, okay I, I get it cool all right um, and yeah, so, well, this was, this was an adventure into the land of configuration parsing. Yeah. So now, uh, I can do things like change field and prompt it and MKR for. All right. Um, Sweet. Nice stuff. Um, and let me know, I mean, this is like, this is sort of like, I think, I think that we covered everything you're going to need here. 
um, but we probably you know, we probably left something out, right? Um, so, and for example, on these labeled, it's going to be need to need to be set to true um, for this merge command. Okay. Yeah. 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 So. Yep. Yeah. Um, but yeah. So that's uh, that is uh, that's the gist of this. The the hour and some gist of this. Yeah. It's 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 a lot to take in. So. Don't yeah, I'll watch, the, I'll watch the meeting again in the morning, tomorrow cool. morning. Cool. Yeah, it's, thanks for staying up fine. late. Also, like, uh, I wanted to talk, uh, if there is time, I want to talk about uh, operations. What about them? Like, I want to add an operation to see how operations work, like, for the image scaling for MNIST, like, we are hard coding it into 28 by 28, right? Yeah. So I want to add an operation image scaling, uh, so that we don't have to uh, hard code it, and yeah. we can do do away with the m dot mnist png file. Yeah. Uh, so, type. so. Okay. So remember how we talked about the pre-processing source, though, too. Uh, yes. Yes. Okay. So, part of that was, um, we were going to add some new syntax to be able to to specify like we had this we have this whole plan laid out where we talked about like okay how are we going to specify in the command line to to call this operation and pass these arguments well unifying this config stuff is going to help us do that easier because it's basically this is going to be the first step in that too um so in in getting rid of the mnist uh pmg and just making it png um so because or else what's going to happen is we're going to have multiple places where we're going to need to change config stuff and once you finish this then everything is going to be sent like in or it's everything's going to be one thing um so i would say like you could go and make the operation if you wanted to and write some test cases yeah, we for talked it about, we talked about this right obviously. yeah yeah so you could make the operation and write some test cases for it um and that would be good that would be a good thing to do um, I would say go for that if you want to, um, but uh, but hold off on doing pre-processing stores until you finish unifying the config. Okay. Okay. Sweet. All right. Anybody got anything else? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. How's it going? Yeah, so I tried the container thing and it worked. All right, great. That's awesome. Yeah, and I also wanted to talk about something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, go for it. Uh, yeah, I know it's been a long call, so if you uh, suggest I should uh, share an example and we could do this over in the group. Yeah, sure thing. Uh, let me just brief you on it. I'm... Uh, using different uh, two different ways to input stuff into the data flow. Uh, actually, I'm using uh, multiple operations, so I'm not sure how exactly to uh, in give them input. Uh, I mean, they all require input, so it's uh, kind of messy. Mm. Can uh, you post the code up? Yeah, I'm posting it right now. Okay, great. So yeah, if you post the code, then we can probably review this offline because I think, yeah, it's probably about time we we all um, called it on this today's meeting. Yeah. Sorry, this uh, sorry to push this to the end, but maybe we should end up actually. Maybe we might we might consider. I don't know. Would it be helpful to have two meetings during the week and and cut the time because we keep going over? What do you guys do? You guys think that that would be helpful or? Yeah, us meeting on Saturday would be perfect. I think Saturday. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I think before weekend we we should have one. Before the weekend, okay. Like, uh, yeah. okay, like uh, Friday morning yeah, then. Yeah, Friday or yeah, Friday or Saturday. Okay, yeah, what? And, okay, yeah. Let's do Friday mornings then, um, because I think I have availability. Then oh, Friday wait. morning. Okay. Uh, so it'll be Friday night for us, right? Uh, uh yeah. Yeah. Well, what what works better there? Uh, night works better. Night works better. So my friday morning yeah okay. yeah it will be your friday morning and ours friday night okay okay that works for me yeah i uh 
that 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 will work all right cool um well let's set that up then and we can start and and we can we can just put that on the calendar and then people can just choose which meeting they want to go to um and uh and we'll try to cut the meeting um off at like 15 after 10 or 10 for me so 15 after the whatever the end time is for you guys um on tuesdays uh and fridays so that that you know, basically, it's like okay, if you haven't if you haven't gotten whatever, then come to the next meeting, um, uh, because I think we've been we've been consistently running wrong long for a few r months now. So, all right, we'll do that then. All right, well, great. Thank you guys very much, and uh, hope you guys get some good sleep. Um, and I will uh, talk to you next week or on Friday. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Good night. Thank you guys. Have a good one. Bye. Thank you.